Is your child upset at the idea of you taking away their TikTok account as punishment? Do they think losing their video games is the worst thing ever? Throughout history, there have always been rules, and people who break them face consequences. In the past, punishments were often very harsh. Today, some countries have prisons that are more comfortable than fancy hotels. But if we look back in time, punishments were much scarier and more brutal. Let's take a look at some of the worst punishments in history. Warning. Some of the things we talk about might be disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. We, the creators of this video, want to make it clear that we do not support or approve of the actions described. Impalement is a cruel and ancient method of torture and capital punishment that has been used since before cities were even built. It involved using a long, sharp stake, often greased, which would be inserted either lengthwise or horizontally into a person's body. These stakes would then be left in public places, such as outside city walls, as a warning to others. In ancient times, impalement was a favored method of instilling fear among people, particularly by the Assyrians, notably Emperor Ashurbanipal. In the late Middle Ages, Vlad Dracul, also known as Vlad the Impaler, proudly used this method as a means of punishment. For longitudinal impalement, the stake would be beneath the elevated prisoner and inserted in between their legs. The gravity then would make sure the spike would run through them, avoiding major organs like the heart, lungs, and spleen, and exiting through the skin of the shoulder, neck, or if they are truly unlucky, the lower part of the skull. A person could survive like this for days, if not weeks. For transversal impalement, the stake would be pierced through the torso, and then the stake would be hoisted up vertically. The garrote. It was a terrifying method of execution. The prisoner would be made to sit on a small chair-like structure with a raised platform attached to an upright pole containing two holes. Their neck would be pushed against the pole, similar to a dental checkup, but much more distressing. A rope would be threaded through the holes to form a loop around the prisoner's neck. On the opposite side of the pole, a stick would be inserted into the loop. The executioner would twist the stick, tightening the rope and cutting off the prisoner's breath. Thanks to historical museums and spy movies like James Bond, the idea of punishing someone for information or a confession seems like a complex process involving knowledge of mechanical engineering and human anatomy. However, this wasn't always the case. Take the garrote, for example, which was used in Spain for centuries as a way to execute people. Historical records suggest that the garrote was first used by the Romans to punish the conspirators of the Second Catalan Conspiracy. Spain and Portugal also used it during the Dark Ages, the Spanish Inquisition, and it was brought to the Americas by the conquistadors. The garrote was infamously used to end the life of the Inca emperor, Arahualpa. In 1813, King Ferdinand VII of Spain made the garrote the official method of execution, replacing hanging. Compared to modern hanging, which is considered relatively humane, executions by hanging in the 19th century and earlier were often brutal and prolonged, causing unnecessary suffering. That changed when an Irish doctor named Samuel Houghton invented a method to ensure immediate death by dropping in 1866. Interestingly, the garrote was introduced in Spain by Napoleon during the Napoleonic Wars of 1808 to 1814, while Ferdinand VII was imprisoned by Napoleon. The garrote was seen as the preferred method to execute guerrilla fighters, priests, and anyone else who resisted the French invaders. Records are incomplete, but it's known that at least 736 people, including 16 women, were executed by garrot during the 19th century. The last public garroting took place in 1897, and from then until 1935, a total of 96 people were executed using this method. In 1935, 80 Freemasons were garroting in the city of Malaga for refusing to give up their religious beliefs and join the armed forces. 
This harsh treatment of Freemasons was a significant factor leading to civil unrest in Spain. The last garroting occurred in 1974. The wheel, also called the Catherine wheel or breaking wheel, was a common method of public execution during the Middle Ages. It's difficult to pinpoint its exact origins, but the earliest recorded mention comes from the author Gregory of Tours in the 6th century CE. The Catherine wheel traveled far and wide, being used for executions in various parts of the world, including Austria, Britain, France, Germany, Rome, the Ottoman Empire, Russia, Sweden, and the Indian subcontinent. There wasn't a set way to use the wheel, as methods varied. Sometimes victims were tied to the wheel's beams and trampled as it moved, while in other cases, they were affixed to cross beams at its center. Executioners typically began by breaking the prisoner's leg bones, then proceeded to break their other bones one by one, either with clubs or by rolling the wheel over them. One notable survivor of this torture was a Jewish man named Jonah, who endured the wheel for four days and four nights in 1348, making him the longest survivor on record. However, like most victims, he ultimately succumbed to his injuries, bleeding to death. Rats have been alongside humans for centuries, migrating to new cities and countries. While many have tried to get rid of them, others have tried to make them pets, but some have used them as weapons. Roman Emperor Nero, whose mental health is debated by historians, is known to have used rats as a form of punishment. He would tie a bucket full of hungry rats to the stomach of his prisoners and then apply heat to the bottom of the bucket. The rats, driven by hunger and the searing heat, would frantically claw and gnaw through anything in their way to escape. Centuries later, in medieval Germany, this torture method was upgraded. Instead of a bucket, a metal cage was used, with a space at the bottom for hot coals. This prolonged the anticipation, anxiety, and torment, often leading to the desired confession from the prisoners. Taking inspiration from this concept, medieval Germany also introduced the rat chair. Here, the prisoner would be forced to sit upright, while a metal cage filled with hungry rats was strapped around their face instead of their belly. During Elizabethan times, the rat-infested dungeons beneath the Tower of London became notorious for the horrors they inflicted, striking fear into the hearts of Catholics in the city. Hidden beneath the tower are several dungeons, contributing to its grim reputation. These cells were built below the high water mark, shrouded in total darkness. Prisoners would listen in terror as rats scurried towards their cells from the River Thames when the tide came in. In the 20th century, rats gained popularity among South American dictators. Figures like Castelo Branco, who ruled Brazil from 1964 to 1985, the five dictators of Uruguay from 1973 to 1986, and General Jorge Rafael Videla in Argentina from 1976 to 1983, all used rats as instruments of torture and terror. The most horrifying stories of rat punishments come from Augusto Pinochet, who governed Chile from 1973 to 1990. He devised a torture method called the rectoscope. A heated metal pipe would be used to force rats towards the prisoner's rear end. Similar to Nero's method, the rats had no choice but to burrow through whatever was in their way to escape the intense heat, the rack. In some places today, cracking knuckles in public is considered impolite. But in medieval times, they took it to another level, they'd stretch you until your joints popped. The rack, invented in 1420 by the Duke of Exeter, was used to stretch prisoners beyond their body's limits until their joints gave way. The aim was to force confessions and information from suspected traitors, heretics, and conspirators. Prisoners would be placed on a wooden frame with their limbs tied to rollers at each end. As the rollers turned, they'd pull the prisoner's joints apart, causing bones to pop, joints to tear, and tendons to come undone. Ah, you speak of Anne Askew, a remarkable woman indeed. As a friend of Catherine Parr and a devout Protestant, she fearlessly shared her beliefs among other women in her social circle. However, 
Her outspokenness led to her arrest for reading and spreading inciting passages from the Bible. During the reign of King Henry VIII, who vacillated between Catholicism and Protestantism, Anne was accused of heresy and subjected to the torture of the rack. Despite the relentless pressure to betray her fellow believers, she refused to yield, enduring the agonizing stretching of her limbs without revealing any names. Truly, her courage and steadfastness in the face of such torment are admirable. Indeed, Anne Askew's bravery was tragically met with a horrific fate. Paralyzed after enduring the rack, she was then bound to a fiery stake and burned alive. Her refusal to renounce her beliefs ultimately cost her life. The use of the rack was not limited to England. Various forms of it were employed in different countries. In England, the rack remained in use until the 17th century. While the exact number of individuals subjected to this torture is unknown, one of the most famous victims was the English rebel Guy Fawkes, who endured this agonizing torment. The Iron Maiden While the Iron Maiden is a well-known fixture in pop culture, there's actually no historical evidence that this metal casket, large enough to contain an adult with interior iron spikes, was used during the Middle Ages. Nevertheless, the image of the Iron Maiden captures the imagination. Standing nearly seven feet tall, its exterior often depicts a woman's face, said to be inspired by the Virgin Mary. However, the true surprise lies within when the casket is opened. The earliest written mention of the Iron Maiden appears in a guidebook to the city of Nuremberg by historian Johann Philipp Siebenkes in 1515. He described spikes intentionally kept small enough to prolong the prisoner's suffering for up to two days before death. However, Sebenkis didn't provide any sources for his account, and no Iron Maiden from that period has been found. In fact, the first known Iron Maiden was created based on Sebenkis' description and was exhibited at the World's Fair in Chicago in 1894. Thanks for being with us so far. Please leave your thoughts in the comments and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next part.